All right. Well, thank you, Whitney. And thank you all for coming today. It's great to be here. This is my first time at Olin. So I'm very impressed. I've been impressed from afar. And now it's really great to get, uh, get a sense of what this place is all about. So uh, as Whitney said, I'm Nick Lanneman. I'm from the University of Notre Dame. And I have the, uh, the fortune of trying to lead a really amazing team uh, for, for uh, an NSF funded center. It's called Spectrum X. And so my goal for today is you know, maybe you don't know much about radio spectrum and wireless technologies around it. So I want to raise awareness of those issues. Or maybe you are somewhat excited about some of the, these issues because you've taken Whitney's class. I want to get you more excited about radio spectrum as a field. Okay, those are my goals. So uh, it turns out there's a lot going on. We've seen some presentations to this effect already, but this is kind of my view of, of a really quick view of what's going on uh, some exciting developments in wireless systems on the one hand, technology development, applications of technology, but also radio spectrum access on the other hand. So we've heard about 5G, uh, 6G, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, eventually Wi-Fi 7, all kinds of you know, technologies that are, that are developing and getting integrated into these devices, enabling all these applications. That's kind of showed up there at Clef. There's a tremendous amount going on to support those devices. The infrastructure, the networks, the towers, the backhaul capacity, right? Uh, another exciting development that, of course, is very near and dear to the hearts of those folks here is, is the uh, deployment of these satellite systems, right? Massive satellite constellations like SpaceX and others. Uh, meanwhile, we're also seeing a transformation in the computing infrastructure from the cloud, not, not as uh, far as the, device, the mobile devices themselves are getting very sophisticated, but the, there's this notion of edge computing. So we're putting more computing at the, these base station towers, uh, and that's dramatically affecting the types of applications that we can pursue, uh, but also the ways in which we utilize networks. And of course, there's a bunch of other non-commercial uses of the radio spectrum and, and wireless technologies, defense, public safety, scientific uses. All of these many applications of wireless technology are putting tremendous pressure on the radio spectrum which you see up there at the right. Okay, so we're, we're seeing all kinds of futuristic applications, uh, connecting even more people and things. And each of these applications is expanding in its use of bandwidth and going up higher and higher in frequency. And so we have a number of really pressing and important challenges that we're faced as a nation. And there's a number of very significant efforts that are trying to address, address those problems from uh, the Next G Alliance, which is a commercial industry-driven effort to sort of standardize 6G and figure out where it's going to live in the radio spectrum. The other extreme is the National Spectrum Consortium, which is focused on defense and uh, updating the defense's use of spectrum. And in between, we have two pretty important initiatives from the National Science Foundation. The Power Project Office, which is building a bunch of test beds, so-called platforms for advanced wireless research, and Spectrum X, which is this new center that, that we're involved in. So there's a lot of really interesting things going on. Uh, so my goals for the talk are really to give you a sense of radio spectrum innovation as a field in and of itself. It's supporting a number of industries. So you, if you think of those industries as being vertical industries, radio spectrum innovation, I'd like to view it today as a horizontal industry that's supporting all of those other industries. So I want to give you a sense of the radio spectrum ecosystem as I see it, the many, many places that you can take the skill sets that you can develop here and go get a job and, and have a meaningful career. Uh, and then it turns out this center is really meant to develop a workforce and prepare students and faculty to get more involved in this space. And so that center is Spectrum X. I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what Spectrum X is all about. And then I want to end with some opportunities for students in Spectrum X specifically. So let me start with the radio spectrum ecosystem. And to motivate this, I want to kind of tell you the story of my spectrum footprint in traveling from Notre Dame to Olin College. So uh, I you know, looked at my options. You can see Notre Dame is there just uh, to the east of Lake Michigan. We're about an hour and a half from downtown Chicago. Olin, as you all know, is what a half hour, 45 minutes from downtown Boston. So um, we decided not to drive. We decided to fly. So my process of getting here basically involved booking a flight. So I used my little app on my phone, my home Wi-Fi system. And as you probably know, that uses a variety of different frequencies, a 2.4, 5 gigahertz band, 
uh, eventually 6 gigahertz. My home Wi-Fi doesn't do 6 gigahertz Wi-Fi yet, but it will one day. So I booked my flight. I had to check the weather to figure out what I needed to pack. How cold is it going to be? Do I need a rain jacket, etc.? And, you know, from my interface point of view, I'm just using another app on the phone, and I'm just connecting to the internet and getting access to that data via Wi-Fi, as with the other application. But there's another very important system behind the scenes, the NOAA weather forecasting system, that's also using the radio spectrum to, in order to gather data about the atmosphere and, and enable weather forecasting. Right? So there's a whole other very sophisticated system involved in giving me that experience and that information. So we, we saw some examples of that uh, in, in earlier presentations today, but uh, some of these systems operate in different bands. Uh, 24 gigahertz band is one of them. All right, after packing, uh, I had to drive to the airport. So I used yet another app, of course. And now there's another satellite system involved in getting me from point A to point B. Right? So I switched from using my home Wi-Fi to transitioning to cellular system. Okay, so uh, 4G, 5G cellular is using all kinds of different bands. One of the bands I want to tout uh, today is the so-called C band, the 3.7 gigahertz band. Um, <clears throat> so I use that to get my navigational information. But of course, there's also a GPS receiver in my phone that tells my phone my location so that I can form the network of my location and figure these things out. So there's that satellite system GPS operating at yet another frequency, uh, transmitting information to that uh, phone my phone in order to get me location information as well. All right, um, I'm flying. It was a two and a half hour flight. I needed to check my email, watch a little bit of uh, 1883, binge watch, right? And so uh, these days I can continue to use my mobile device and it has a Wi-Fi interface to the plane, but how is the plane getting internet connectivity? Right? There's actually a satellite system, uh, yet another satellite system that's providing that internet connectivity. In the case of Delta Airlines, they use Viasat. Each different airline has a different partner for this. Um, and this is yet another range of frequencies that we're using in the radio spectrum to enable that end user experience. When we get here, we, we booked an Uber to come from the airport uh, to Olin College. And again, we're using a different app, but uh, relying on a bunch of infrastructure and back to our GPS uh, receiver as well. So I'm using on a daily basis, even an hourly basis, multiple different applications or systems that are using various parts of the radio spectrum. And I don't, maybe most people don't even realize how much of a spectrum footprint they actually have. A little more motivation, the smartphone device in your pocket probably has on the order of five or six radios, depending upon its generation. Multiple versions of Wi-Fi, cellular, GPS, Bluetooth, and maybe near field communication. And some of them now even have satellite radios in them. So again, the one device is integrating all these technologies. That plane that I flew on has a tremendous number of radio systems on it. One of the most important and most recently uh, 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 controversial of which is called the radar altimeter, which you see there uh, in, in sort of the middle of the craft on the bottom side. This is a device that sends out a signal and receives a reflection to estimate distance or alti altitude from the ground. And it's very important in, la in landing situations, okay? Um, and so I'm gonna come back to this issue. It turns out that there's been some conflicts between that particular use of spectrum and growth of 5G. That weather system that we mentioned, it actually consists of two primary satellites that are geostationary. It's operated by NOAA, and there's a backup satellite, and there's a variety of different communication links, sensing frequencies, and then rebroadcasting links that are used to uh, accomplish that mission of gathering weather, uh, you know, atmospheric measurements, transmitting those measurements to ground, enabling the ground station there, the ground operations facility to compute weather imagery that is pushed back up to the satellite and rebroadcasted on different frequencies in order to give your weather uh, forecasting information at various stations. So it's a fascinating complex system and each one of those links we're gonna be worried about interference on them. So I want to end here with this initial motivational uh, part of the talk to say there's a tremendous number, even if you don't think about your own spectrum footprint, there's a tremendous number of the different parts of the radio spectrum that you use on a daily basis, and you probably don't even realize it. Or your mom and dad or your siblings don't realize it. And maybe they need to. And if you're at the point where you know a little bit about this, it might be a good time for you to start sharing this with them 
so that they can better understand some of the things that are going on in the world. So one of them that I, want, that I really like to highlight is this C-band example. So there's a band of spectrum. First of all, this is, the, this is the spectrum allocation chart in the United States. As you probably know, we have two regulatory bodies that, that control the use of the spectrum. The FCC manages the commercial use of spectrum, and the NTIA manages the government use of spectrum. We regulate uh, from roughly 6 kilohertz all the way up to 275 gigahertz. So let's just round and call that 275 gigahertz of spectrum. Uh, the C-band is a range of frequencies uh, roughly in this region from 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz. That is 280 megahertz of spectrum. So again, let's round. Let's call that one one-thousandth of the radio spectrum that we regulate. Okay? With me so far? So if I take one one-thousandth of the radio spectrum and I say I want to repurpose it in order to allow cellular systems to continue to grow and support all these applications on the phones that we all use on a daily basis, and we'll auction off 280 megahertz of spectrum to enable more 4G and 5G system deployments. How much money do you think that auction, that recently happened, the FCC auctioned off this band. It's only one one thousandth of the radio spectrum as a whole. How much money, and if you, if you gave the, uh, if you study this problem in, in the class, you can't answer, but how much money do you think this, uh, this band of spectrum was auctioned for? The actual number is $81 billion, okay? So one one thousandth of the radio spectrum for $81 billion. So spectrum is a big deal. And this was primarily auctioned off to the AT&Ts and Verizons of the world. They wanted to deploy more 5G to keep us all happy with our service. And what happened about a year ago, the FAA said, whoa, wait a second. Remember that radar altimeter that I showed you on that aircraft? The C-band might be too close to our radar altimeters. The, the C-band is from this particular um, band for in C-band is 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz. The radar altimeters operate from 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz. That might be a bit too close. So let's slow things down. Let's reconsider how we're going to deploy these cellular networks around airports where we need to safely land aircraft. And so all of a sudden, out of nowhere, after the federal government auctions off $81 billion worth of spectrum, we have two major industries and two regulatory bodies fighting it out in the press. Right around the Christmas holidays but people don't necessarily know why. It all comes down to spectrum and potential interference between these radio systems. And so if we know about these technology issues, if we know about these regulatory issues, maybe we can help address these problems and we can avoid these flare-ups. So what I want to convey is that there's some really big things going on and there's a lot of intricacy to it, but that also means there's a lot of opportunity for people who are in the know. Okay, so really quickly, what I want to do is give you a sense of all the people, all the organizations in government and industry that care about Spectrum, that are involved in this innovation process of trying to make use of Spectrum uh, to, to you know, improve our quality of life, promote economic development, health and safety, and so forth. So let's start with government. These are all the regulators. I mentioned the FCC and the NTIA. They're the regulators in the U.S., there's actually a global treaty organization called the ITU, which regulates spectrum at the global level. And then the various parts of our federal government get involved. The uh, Congress allocates a lot of budget authority. Uh, the, Office of White, the, the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy gets pretty heavily involved, oversees a lot of these, uh, these agencies. And then finally, the Department of State is actually the, the conduit to the ITU. Every major federal agency that uses spectrum has to report up their needs of spectrum and coordinate their uses of spectrum through the NTIA. So they all have spectrum managers and program managers and project managers that, that deal with spectrum. There are also a bunch of major labs where you can get involved in doing research. A lot of funding agencies that support work that use spectrum or, or innovate around spectrum. Uh, we've mentioned radio astronomy in some of the presentations, exploring our universe by measuring radio frequencies. We have a number of 
of uh, funding programs and observatories that support that. Environmental sensing, again, a number of, of different organizations. And then we, can, we transition to commercial. So there's a cellular industry, very large and, and uh, productive industry these days. There's also CBR, sorry, Wi-Fi. We mentioned Wi-Fi a few times, a number of big players in Wi-Fi. There's this new ecosystem called CBRS, which sits, which sits kind of between the two. So it's traditionally cellular equipment, but with more of a Wi-Fi-like approach to accessing spectrum. This is a relatively new ecosystem. Satellite industry, very, very uh, vibrant going on, a uh, lot of activity these days. The mobile devices themselves, there's a ton of innovation. The chips that go into these various devices. Defense, cloud. The traditional cable industry, which is becoming increasingly wireless focused. Uh, a number of very interesting startups in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and applications. Test and measurement companies, consulting, think tanks. Academia has really built up a lot of infrastructure to pursue uh, innovation here. Uh, from a number of centers and institutes around the US, uh, these platforms that I mentioned earlier, there are currently five of them, uh, enabling fairly large-scale uh, experimental testing with programmable wireless systems for different applications. And then uh, there's a growing number of these industry, university, uh, government hubs, what I call hubs, where uh, they're bringing together these different parts of the ecosystem to address certain challenges. And uh, the most recent one of these is Spectrum X, which I want to talk more about. Uh, a number of professional organizations actually have spectrum or spectrum policy focus groups. And so what I want to convey again is that there's really an enormous number of places where people who understand wireless systems and radio spectrum matters can get involved and make a difference. So hopefully I gave you a quick glimpse of that and maybe got you excited about pursuing some careers in it. So what is Spectrum X and how can we help you with that enterprise? Our goal with Spectrum X, this is an NSF funded center. It's a five year, $25 million initial grant from National Science Foundation. And we wanna create the academic hub in this radio spectrum ecosystem. I should maybe start to say we actually, we are creating the, the academic hub in the radio spectrum ecosystem. So we're not trying to replicate those other parts of the ecosystem. We're trying to create an academic home where faculty and students can get involved and interact with these other parts of the ecosystem and make a difference, okay? This is the team as of the time that we, we uh, started our award. We have 27 universities, including Olin College, uh, and a number of other ones that are shown here in the squares. 27 universities, 14 minority serving institutions. Uh, it's led by the University of Notre Dame and our Wireless Institute that I'm a co-leader of. We have a number of collaborators, both in industry, government, and internationally that are involved. But this is where we are today. The plan is to add to the team over time and get more and more universities and companies and government agencies involved. It's really exciting, big, uh, big science, big engineering, collaborative research enterprise. Here's the logo version of that slide. So a number of top institutions, of course, we're excited to have on our team. At the end of the day, what really matters, matters is the people on the team who work together uh, we have a number of meetings every week where these folks interact in our working groups. And we basically reached out across uh, academia to find people who had been involved in spectrum uh, research or wireless technology research, but especially who were aware of these notions of spectrum coexistence and spectrum sharing. Uh, and, and so that's how we formed this initial team. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to build this team and work together with it to accomplish, start accomplishing a bunch of our objectives the first of which was to win the, the funding award, of course. So there's a, a variety of expertise from building stuff, uh, writing policy papers, teaching, uh, you know, being innovative in our teaching, writing textbooks and so on around the radio spectrum. A lot of things that we pulled together as a team, uh, which is exciting. Our goal is really to create more autonomy decentralize as much as we can the management of the radio spectrum from very paper-heavy processes to more automated cloud-based data-driven systems 
Uh, the idea is we want to have a lot of sensors out there that help us understand what's going on and collect that data and provide the, the cloud infrastructure, the edge computing infrastructure, the algorithms to help automate the allocation and the management and the enforcement of, of radio spectrum to, uh, to speed things up, to make it more accessible, uh, make it more heavily utilized. And so we've, we've got a number of activities in this center that you can get involved in as a student and as a faculty member. Um, so, so I'm going to highlight a few of the, high, the broad strokes of each of the elements of the center. So starting with research, we have an organizational structure where we have working groups. And the job of the working groups is really to survey the landscape and understand what's going on out there and suggest directions that either Spectrum X or the broader community can be pursuing uh, in our research enterprise. And then we have spun off uh, initially six project teams to pursue research, to fill in some gaps that we've identified in the, in the ecosystem as a whole. So focusing very heavily on enabling technologies and policies that promote uh, coexistence with passive systems, uh, scientific systems in particular, coexistence with active systems like radars, uh, sensor designs, you know, going back to that vision, being able to de deploy low cost sensors and collect data from them. Once we have a bunch of deployed sensors, then we have a big data problem, and so we have to have a, a focus on data. And then we have a bunch of non-engineering uh, uh, working groups or projects focused on how do you actually define and assign spectrum rights in more flexible ways. And then once you do all of that and you actually assign these rights, how do you actually enforce them and protect them in some scalable automated way? And so we think we have a pretty comprehensive approach to doing research. It's inherently interdisciplinary. And so it's really exciting to have uh, all those activities going on. And each, each one of these groups meets every other week, basically, to check in on research prog progress and plan next steps. <clears throat> Very unique to Spectrum X is this notion that we want to have a lot of engagement with the policy sphere. So we can't actually advocate for a particular policy or a particular party over another. But what we can try to do is engage with the policymakers at the FCC, the NTIA, the, NTI, uh, the ITU, uh, understand what they're thinking about, share with them what we've been thinking about, try to be kind of a third part, a trusted third party that can provide uh, objective analyses and, and suggestions for them to consider. And so this is an effort that uh, is, is growing now. Um, and we're encouraging faculty to get involved and submit comments to the formal FCC and NTIA processes and so that's uh, something I know that's been, been happening here at Olin as well. So that's cool. Uh, another very important part of the Spectrum X mandate is education and workforce development. And so here the idea is that we want to raise awareness early on and keep that awareness growing over time. So our strategy is to develop curriculum at the middle school, high school level, at the undergraduate level, and at the master's level. Uh, to provide this interdisciplinary, really broad set of use cases view of, of uh, radio spectrum, uh, and to create pathways for students to get involved, get exposed, uh, upskill, uh, get more engaged in the ecosystem. So we have a bunch of outreach activities planned and uh, summer schools and, and research experiences that are going to be uh, proceeding along in parallel with this curriculum development, uh, which is exciting. And I'm going to highlight here in a bit that we're actually starting to develop the master's curriculum here this year. Uh, an, another component is that we really see an opportunity to broaden participation in this field, not just grow uh, you know, engineering students, uh, specifically from predominantly white institutions, but students more generally from economics backgrounds, poly, political science backgrounds, computer science. Electrical engineering is probably a, a foothold for this field, physics. Uh, but also from minority serving institutions. So we really want to grow the representation and the participation of women and underrepresented minority, minorities. And so we have a very, very uh, specific plan to create a, 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 an inclusive culture within the center uh, so that everyone can develop professionally and be more welcoming and inclusive through what we call the intercultural development inventory uh, and our DEI training. And then we have, a, 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 as I said before, we have 14 minority serving institutions that are on board as partners with which we're going to start to develop collaborative relationships to uh, enhance their capacity to pursue research and attract their students to the field. Uh, collaboration is going to be key. So this year, in, we're in year two of the center. We're starting to ramp up on collaboration and getting uh, industry and government agencies on board. 
Government agencies will, will have no cost to join Spectrum X and become part of what we call our Collaboration Advisory Board. And then industry, we're going to be inviting to get involved in a, a relatively low cost but tiered membership fee format uh, so that they can get involved and help us steer our projects as we go forward. So that's kind of a summary of the center. And I just want to highlight a few opportunities for students to, again, you know, not just be aware of it, but get more involved in the center. And then we'll wrap up, and I'll be happy to take some Q&A. Uh, so at a high level, I already mentioned that there's going to be a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity here. We have undergraduate research opportunities that we can fund through Spectrum X. Uh, we're, we have, a, through all those research projects, we're always going to be recruiting for interdisciplinary graduate student and postdoctoral research. Um, the, the team that we're building with all the industry and government agency representatives, there's going to be tremendous opportunities for pursuing uh, networking and career opportunities as part of Spectrum X. And the things that are evolving pretty rapidly now are these curriculum uh, developments. Uh, we do have kind of a beginning of a fellowship program for graduate students. And eventually, as we have a big enough group uh, of students and faculty involved, we want to have a career fair on a more recurring basis. So just a, quick, a couple of quick highlights here. We do have an open opportunity for undergraduate research projects to be sponsored by Spectrum X. So if you've been pursuing work in Whitney's class here at Olin and you're interested in continuing that work as a funded research project, you can hit that link and you can apply with, I would encourage you to do so with your faculty advisor, of course, uh, but you can hit that link to apply for undergraduate research. The funding we have today is for you to use at your home institution so that would be here at Olin. But we are also going to be spinning up opportunities for you to go to other Spectrum X institutions during the summer uh, to pursue, uh, be a part of a cohort of, of undergraduate researchers, say at Notre Dame, at UCLA. I think CU Boulder is interested in doing something like that as well. Uh, and that will grow over time. So there'll be a lot of opportunity to, to explore around and sample other academic environments through this REU program. I mentioned we are starting to develop our courses. So especially if you have things you would want to be able to learn in a master's level course uh, that would be offered by Spectrum X, we'd love to hear from you. So the faculty, current, there's a current call for proposals. And I think they were, most of the proposals were coming in yesterday. Uh, now the faculty are going to be selected and they're going to be developing their plans for the course. And so we'd love to hear from students what you would like to learn in order to be uh, as successful as you can be uh, using this master's curriculum. This is intended to be offered through the Coursera platform. So we're going to develop these materials, put them on Coursera. You can take all three uh, courses and get a, a certificate through Coursera. But we're also going to make the course content available for each faculty member in Spectrum X to develop into a four credit offering at their home institution, if that's what they want to do. So it's kind of a hybrid approach to developing the materials. And the last thing is, you know, I'm sure there are big career fairs where lots of companies come and try to encourage you to pursue a career with them. Uh, as a faculty member, I always try to, to encourage students to at least consider graduate school. If you have a certain interest in a field and you want to go uh, pursue advanced uh, studies, graduate school can be a really great experience, either a master's degree or a PhD. I think it's fair to say that pretty much every institution in Spectrum X and every one of our collaborators in industry and government would love to see more students pursuing gra uh, graduate degrees uh, in this field. And so uh, particularly with spec within Spectrum X, we're trying to promote more collaboration, co-advising from multiple faculty with different expertise uh, to develop students that have that interdisciplinary uh, skill set. And they will be more marketable in various careers as we go forward. So we encourage you to hit that link if you're interested in, in learning more about graduate school. Uh, and or postdoctoral studies with, with Spectrum X. So that's what I had prepared for today. Um, I really encourage you to get more involved if, if you have the interest. Uh, we can get your contact info from the link on the left. And then we have a pretty active LinkedIn and, and uh, website that we try to push a lot of our information about what's going on in Radio Spectrum broadly. And some of the materials that we've seen here today, we're hoping that we'll ultimately push to these channels as well. Thanks for your time and please get more involved.